great to be together in God's house. Um, just um, one little thing to add to what Dave said before we get into today's message. Um, if you're part of Hope Church, uh, and as yet don't serve on any of the teams, uh, we'd love you to take one of these little forms here, which has on it all the different areas that you can serve in the life of Hope Church. Uh, we really are a family here, and we want everyone to play their part, play their part on the team. Teamwork makes the dream work, and uh, you know, as we're back in person, uh, as we're streaming online, there's loads of places that you can get involved and play your part. So, um, do take one of these, fill it out, give it to me or to one of the welcome team, and we would love um, to have you part of what God is doing here at Hope Church. Okay, today is the final part uh, of our message series in Nehemiah called Refocus, Rebuild revival. I hope you've been enjoying uh, our series in Nehemiah. I think it's been incredibly relevant to where we are today. Just a very quick recap, in case you've missed uh, most of the series, or just to get everyone up to speed. So for 141 years, Jerusalem and God's people were a mess, complete mess. And God called a man called Nehemiah, who was a cupbearer to the king. He called him to rebuild God's people, to rebuild the physical walls of Jerusalem and to rebuild God's people. Now, the rebuilding of the walls took 52 days to gather the people, to get the resources, to make it happen. It took 52 days to rebuild the walls. That's the first six chapters of Nehemiah. Then we read in the next six chapters how Nehemiah rebuilds God's people, how they establish that the reading of God's word is to be an important and paramount part of God's people again, how there's worship, corporate worship. There's chapter 10, promises that God's people make, covenant promises that they make. And it takes 12 years to rebuild God's people. Interesting, isn't it? To do something physically, to physically rebuild a wall, takes 52 days. To rebuild God's people takes 12 years. And at the end of chapter 12, it's a fairy tale. At the end of chapter 12, everything is perfect. In a way, you would want the book to finish there. But scripture is full of realism. It doesn't present a romantic view of life to us. It gives us life warts and all. The Bible is, is full of failures and broken promises. It is full of Jacob cheating his brother, of David committing adultery, of Peter lying that he ever knew or met with Jesus. The Bible is honest. The Bible is full of of real life. So we get to Nehemiah chapter 13. And just to give you one more piece of a jigsaw before we get into the text. So Nehemiah, at the end of chapter 12, when God's people have been rebuilt after 12 hard years, where they're worshiping on the walls, praising God, reading the Bible, Nehemiah basically retires. Bible scholars say he was probably around 60 years old. He goes back to Susa. You could just imagine him. Nehemiah's there. He's got his pipe, his slippers. He's chilling out. He's taking it easy. He's done his hard work. He's retired. He's off the scene. But within a year, everything is falling apart. Within a year, all that Nehemiah had worked towards has basically been destroyed. The people in leadership made terrible decisions. People have turned their backs on God, and the people have been led astray. So end of chapter 12, obedience. Everything is fantastic. Chapter 13, sin and rebellion. So with that in mind, we're going to read Nehemiah chapter 13. We're going to read verses 1 to 14. So if you've got a Bible, you might want to follow along. Otherwise, it will come up on the screen. On that day, the book of Moses was read aloud in the hearing of the people. And there it was found, written, that no Ammonite or Moabite 
should ever be admitted into the assembly of God. Because they had not met the Israelites with food and water, but had hired Balaam to call a curse down on them. Our God, however, turned the curse into a blessing. When the people heard this law, they excluded from Israel all who were of foreign descent. Before this, Eliashib, the priest, had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah, and he had provided him with a large room formerly used to store the grain offerings and incense and temple articles, and also the tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil prescribed for the Levites, the musicians, and gatekeepers, as well as the contributors for the priests. But while all this was going on, I, that's Nehemiah, was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I have returned to the king. Sometime later, I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned about the evil thing Eliashib had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. I was greatly displeased and threw all of Tobiah's household goods out of the room. I gave orders to purify the rooms, and then I put back into them the equipment of the house of God with the grain offerings and the incense. I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them, and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. So I rebuked the officials and said to them, why is the house of God neglected? Then I called them together and stationed them at their posts. All Judah brought the tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil into the storerooms. I put Shemaiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, and a Levite named Padiah in charge of the storerooms, and made Hanam, son of Zachar, the son of Matani, their assistant because they were considered trustworthy. They were made responsible for distributing the supplies to their fellow Levites. Remember me for this, my God, and do not blot out what I have so faithfully done for the house of my God and its services. Okay, we're going to ask two questions today. What went wrong? What went wrong, chapter 13? What went wrong when Nehemiah went to Susa and retired? What went wrong? And then what is the right response? So let's start with what went wrong. The clear summary of what went wrong is that the people's standards slipped. Gradually, over time, people were no longer checking in with God's word. They were no longer worshiping. They were no longer gathering into God's house. And they were living for themselves. And over time, they slipped and they slided and they slipped and they sided. They were no longer living as set apart from other nations. They were intermarrying and there was no difference between the Israelites and the people of other lands. The promises of chapter 10, you can go and read the covenant promises they made in chapter 10 to sit under the word of God, to Sabbath to not have mixed marriages, to give their tithes and their offerings. They were all broken by chapter 13. And this is a reminder for all of us how easily things can slip and slide over time. So I want us to dig a little bit deeper here. What were the reasons for this slip and slide? I want to dig a little bit deeper and say what went wrong. First thing. Tolerance overtakes truthfulness. Just to completely get you up to speed about what has happened, in verse 4 and 5, what had happened was Tobiah, do you remember Tobiah? Charles preached a wonderful message a few weeks back about the opposition at the wall. Who were the main opponents at the wall? Tobiah and Sambalat. So this is an Ammonite and an enemy of God, and he ends up, having a family, in his, someone in his family having married into the high priest's family, which was forbidden, and he was given a room in the temple. So Tobiah had used his influence. He was an enemy of God, remember, 
but he finds himself with a room in the temple of God. The enemy of God is living in the temple of God. That's what was happening after a year of Nehemiah having left. The enemy of God, Tobiah, is living in the temple. I mean, you can't get much worse than that. You say, well, how did that happen? Well, Eliabeth, the high priest, I think was basically a really nice guy. And he didn't challenge anything. He just let it happen. He was tolerant of the sinfulness and it invaded the house of God. Now, I want to make a really important point here. Sometimes when it comes to tolerance and it comes to pointing things out, Christians can be very good about pointing the finger out there and pinpointing things in culture and pinpointing things in the world. But I don't think that's where our priority should be. I think what Jesus talks about and I think what we should be about is making sure that the house of God is holy. It's making sure that as believers and as the church, there is no sin within our midst. It's interesting, Jesus did not talk about tolerance in the Gospels, but he did in Revelation. In Revelation 2 and verse 19 to 20, this is Jesus speaking to the church in Tyathera. Verse 19, he says this, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceeded the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. You see, Jesus is challenging the church. He's challenging the church to be holy and set apart. And I think the challenge for us as a church is to not let Tolerance for things to happen in our midst overtake truthfulness to God's word. And our focus should be on God's house and God's family and not the world out there. It's interesting, Jesus talks about in the Gospels taking sin seriously. He talks about cutting off your hands and your feet if it makes you sin. He's talking about tearing your eyes out if they cause you to sin. It's shocking language to make the point that we're not to tolerate sin in our own lives and in the lives of our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're to speak the truth in love. We're to love our brothers and sisters by challenging them with truthfulness. In terms of the wider society, I believe our focus should be the good news of Jesus, the grace of God, giving them an invitation to the gospel, to Jesus. For us as God's people and as the family of God, there should be a challenge of truthfulness and an intolerance of sin. So that's the first thing that was going on in this time for Nehemiah when he had left and he had seen this take over. There was a tolerance Sorry, an intolerance of truthfulness. Tolerance overtake tr truthfulness. Second thing, the second thing going on here was that the feelings of people had overtaken honoring God. So I think it's important to know that the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is offensive to some. Jesus offended people in his ministry, left, right, and center. Jesus himself said, John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's an exclusive claim that only in Jesus is there salvation. No other religion, no other way, only Jesus. Now, for some, that is offensive. But we have to proclaim it. It's an offer for all. It's an offer for all mankind. But we mustn't not proclaim it because it could be seen to be offensive. Equally, the grace of God. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. The grace of God can be seen to be offensive. 
Because it offers a way in for everybody, from the worst of sinners to the holiest of holies. All of them can come to heaven through Jesus Christ. It's not about your merit. It's not about your bank balance. It's not about what you do or you don't do. It's purely about having faith and trust in Jesus. Some people find that offensive. Some people find that hard to swallow. But we're not to worry about people's feelings. We're to honor God by proclaiming truth. How did Tobias' family end up marrying the high priest's family? How did Tobiah end up living in the temple? I think it was because no one challenged. No one wanted to upset his feelings. No one wanted to say anything. The result was that the whole thing dishonored God. You see, in all areas, and we're to be full of grace in this, and it talks about speaking the truth in love. There's a whole sermon there, and it's something we all need to learn to do better. But you see, there's in all areas, it's, it's God's truth that there is to matter more than anything else. We're first to look to honor God and honor him at all times. Third thing that I think if we dig a little bit deeper, we find was that in Israel at this time, in Jerusalem at this time, they had lost a sense of the seriousness of sin. You see, Eliasip, the, the high priest, had obviously drifted away from God. He had turned away and let things slip. If he had been walking closely to God, then these things would never have happened. And I think the reason that took place was that there was a, a kind of shrugging his shoulders to sin, a shrugging his shoulders to these things not really mattering. God detests sin. He hates it. He hates it. And when we lose the seriousness of sin, I think we're in trouble. Why does God hate sin so much? He hates it so much because it separates us from God. Why does God hate sin so much? Because it, it separates us from one another. Sin separates us from God. It separates us from one another. It drives a wedge between our relationship with God and with other people. It creates death and destruction. From Genesis chapter 3, throughout scripture, throughout history, it's sin that has created a, a death and destruction throughout history of time. It's created misery and pain. And when we lose the seriousness of sin, marriages are destroyed, lives are lost, families are decimated, churches are ruined. And that's what happened in Nehemiah 13. Eliaseb, the high priest, had lost the seriousness of sin. So that's what went wrong. That's kind of the, the bad news. That was what went wrong when Nehemiah had gone and retired back to Susa. But what's the right response? When bad things happen, when people mess up, when people make bad choices, what's the right response? Now, it's interesting to know that Nehemiah could have just stayed where he was. You know, he was 60, 70 years old. He was in retirement. He could have just said, I've had enough. I built the wall. I spent 12 years kind of sowing myself into these people, building them up, getting them to worship, getting them to read God's word again. I've had enough. I'm exhausted. I cannot go again. But Nehemiah doesn't do that. He goes back into battle. He doesn't give up. He goes and deals with the sin of the people. So what does he do? And I think Nehemiah here is so helpful for each of us. What does he do? Firstly, there is righteous anger in what Nehemiah does. Verse 7 to 8. Nehemiah says plainly, I was very angry. He is angry at the sin he sees. He is angry at the dishonoring of God's house. He is angry at the injustice and the way that things have slipped and slided over the past year. Now, you see, God is love. 
And God loves all of us, and God loves us with an everlasting love. But God is also angry and hates sin and injustice. And in the same way, Jesus, same way as Nehemiah, Jesus was angry at the defilement of the house of God. When he came and saw the money lenders and he saw the mess that they were making and the defilement that they were making of God's house, he upturned the tables. He threw out the money lenders because of a defilement to God's house. And you need to hear this. That is okay to be angry at evil and injustice. It's okay. I think sometimes Christians think, oh, I can't be angry at that or that because all Christians aren't meant to be angry. No, no, Nehemiah was angry at what he found. Jesus was angry at the injustice and the defilement of God's temple. When we hear things about, you know, the the mistreatment of, of, of children, when we hear about employees ripping people off, when we hear about injustice, when we hear about racism, when we hear about all these things, it's right to be angry. To let a righteous anger burn up inside of us. To think, no, that is wrong. No, that is not how God intended it. That reflects the heart of God. As someone said, righteous anger is right anger in the right way. I like that. Righteous anger is right anger in the right way. And it causes a change in a righteous and a godly way. So Nehemiah is angry, but, you know, what does he then do next? Next, he takes action, verse 8 to 9. He isn't just angry, has a hissy fit, and then walks out. He's angry, and what does he do first? He throws out Tobiah's stuff. I mean, he chucks it out of the temple. He can't believe that an enemy of God has been living in the temple, so he chucks it out. He cleanses The temple. It's the first thing that he does. But he doesn't then just clear the temple. He does that first. But then, verse 9 and verse 12, he fills the temple with godly things. He fills the temple back with the things that should have been there. Good things, godly things, things that God ordained to be there. And I think it's really helpful here, you know, in our own lives. Sometimes we get very good at confessing our sins. We get very good at kind of repenting or cleansing our lives and asking for God's forgiveness. And that's good. And that's right. We get angry at the time we've messed up. We ask for God's forgiveness. We're cleansed. But we then have an empty room in our heart, an empty room in our mind. And it's a vacuum. And we need to then fill our minds, fill our hearts with goodness, with God's things, with scripture, with truth with worship songs, with right, good relationships, time with good people who would do us good. So this is so practical and helpful, and I hope you take this on board. You know, when we do do wrong, when we do mess up, yes, cleanse. Yes, get it out. Yes, ask for God's forgiveness. But then, fill your life with things that are good. Keep filling your life with what is good and what is right and what is true. And then thirdly, what what does he do thirdly? What does Nehemiah do thirdly? Verse 14, he prays. He prays and he says to God, look, remember me for what I am doing. Because this is not a popular thing. Calling out the sins of the people, chucking out Tobiah, calling people to repent, criticizing the opposition, going kind of full-on AWOL on everything that's going on, that's not popular. But God, I'm doing this for you. I want to honor you, God, above all else. I'm doing this for an audience of one. I'm doing this, Lord God, because I am a good and faithful servant. So Nehemiah prays that God would reward him and remember what he has done. So let me ask you a question. How do you respond when you mess up or you see sin around you in God's people? How do you respond? I think there's to be an anger, a sense of injustice, a sense of let God's heart rise up within you. Then there must be action. 
Some people get the anger and then they stop and don't do anything. But there's the anger to rise up, the righteous anger, right anger in a right way. But then it's to lead to cleansing, action, doing something, and then filling, filling with what is good and what is right, and then prayer for God's protection and God's favor. Now, let me kind of round everything up for you this morning. Every religion on this planet is all about what must I do to get to God? What must I do to placate God, to please God? Every religion except Christianity. Because Christianity is about what Jesus has done for us on the cross. So I want to show you something. Nehemiah 13. Nehemiah saw a people, a nation, who were in a mess. They had sinned. They had tolerated sin. They had messed up big time. So what did Nehemiah do? He left Susa. He left his comfort of retirement. He left Susa and went to Jerusalem. He there saw the sin firsthand that he hated, and he did something about it. He cleansed the temple. He changed the leaders, and he sorted out the problem. But here's the thing. It wasn't long before the cycle started up again. If you read the Bible, it wasn't long before the Israelites did exactly the same thing. It wasn't long before they slipped and slid and slipped and slid again and again and again. That was Nehemiah. Now let's think about Jesus. You see, Jesus in heaven looked at the world and saw the sin and the mess. And Jesus left heaven and came down to earth. Jesus hates sin, but he loves humanity. He loves each one of us. So he does something about it. But he does something, not that would then be messed up or need resetting in a year's time or 10 years' time or whenever it was. No, Jesus does something once and for all. He goes to the cross and he takes on our sin and our shame. Jesus dies in my place. Jesus deals with the sin once and for all. And the cross, friends, the cross is the place where God's wrath and God's mercy meet. It's the place where his hatred for sin and his love for mankind meet at the death of his son, Jesus Christ. Great exchange takes place. Jesus dies in our place and we go free. So I want to ask you two, two questions. Do you fully appreciate, do you fully realize what Jesus has done for you? The grace and the love of our Lord demonstrated on that cross. And then the second question. How do you respond to sin? How do you respond to sin in your own life and the sin in the world around us? Are you like Jesus? Are you like Nehemiah? Is there an anger, an injustice that, that, that wells up inside of you? A hatred to sin? Or are you just, meh, shrug your shoulders, tolerate? Because like Jesus, like Nehemiah, there should be an action, a repentance, a turning from our sin, and a turning to God, and a filling afresh with his Holy Spirit and the good things of God. So what we're going to do is this. In a minute, we're going to take communion together. If uh, Jonathan and um, Adam could come up. In a minute or two, we're going to take communion together. We've got these little individual uh, communion cups, wafers, which you'll find under your seats. We're going to take them together in a moment. Because in communion, we have the perfect 
reminder of what we've been talking about. We have the perfect reminder of God's love for us through Jesus Christ. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray. We're then going to sing part of a song. We're going to worship. We're going to stand. And then I'm going to take us through communion. I'm going to take us through taking the bread, the wafer, the wine as a reminder of what Jesus has done for us, as a reminder of the seriousness of sin, but the grace of our God and the love of our God. So let's stand where we are. I'll pray. We'll then worship for a short while, and then I'll come back and we will take communion together. Let me pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for the brutal reality of Scripture. Thank you for the realism of of Nehemiah chapter 13. For the mess, the slip, the slide, the, the mess of God's people. But Lord, thank you that in that realism, in that mess, there is hope. In that realism and in that mess of our own lives, there is hope. And that hope is Jesus. Because Jesus has died for us on the cross. And Jesus Christ takes away our sin, takes away our shame, cleanses us, cleanses us completely. And then fills us afresh with the Spirit of God. We thank you for what, Jesus, you have done in our lives. Let's worship.